And we're back! Hello, everyone! Why is that screen black? Good start. Okay, it's back. Cool. Excellent. Start as we mean to go on. We're back! Hello! Uh, yes! Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, happy time zones, wherever you might be. I'm Emma, and welcome back, at long last, to the House of Hubris, here on twitch.tv slash Sarasant, uh, where we have brain cell activity. I try, at least. Yeah, it's been, it's been a couple weeks. Been a couple weeks. I have missed this, not gonna lie. And touching so much wood right now because we have finally changed ISP. So in theory, some of the tech gremlins should be gone. The weird CPU chug, probably not going to change for the mi minute. Uh, I, I don't know how I'm gonna fix that beyond just getting a new rig and not streaming off the laptop I've been running off for the last several years. But hey. Yeah. Uh, we should stop just dropping out uh, for no reason. Of course, touch wood, and as I was saying on socials, uh, I want this to be kind of a stability test, so I just thought we'd play something short, probably a one-off, and I thought, you know what? I remember when we did Meat Punks, and that was great, and, you know, it's been a while since we did a visual novel about a weird alien setting with a strong focus on biology. So here's South Scrimshaw Part 1, which I've been advertised as a, it's a visual novel that's a nature documentary about alien whales. I believe there will be some moderately visceral content because it's a nature documentary and nature red and tooth and claw and everything that is a 14 hour clock don't love that so strong focus on biology sounds like a euphemism for a dating sim mechanic i'm reasonably sure this is not a, one of those games but i don't know because i don't know that much about this wanted to go in fairly blind because as much as anything else it's free which are the real words it was sold to me with. Uh, so, let's just get into it, shall we? Uh, there is voice acting in this game. I have turned it off because I enjoy reading visual novels to y'all. The, does the start button not work now, game? There we go. If dating pigeons exist, dating space whales is certainly a goal. Go, I, I mean... That game almost certainly exists. This is not it, as far as I know. South Grimshaw is a linear read, but there are information tangents to explore. Oh no, information tangents. This is just my life. The text of a different colour can be clicked uh, to learn more about a subject. While there are no egg-laying mammals, none of them are whales. That's true. In recent years, the sea bunny is most defined by Will Voynich's cartoons. Excuse me? C can you click these? Is this the sea bunny? Oh no, this is Rudolf Pindersnipe. He's our legal counsel. And a snowpalope. We present a visual novel with information tangents. Well, there goes Emma. Yeah, no, I... Uh, to be fair, at least you can... You know, I'll, st I'll still be on camera. You'll all know where I am. I'll just be here forever. Oh. Right, the legal counsel is here to tell us that this is a work of fiction. Names, characters, businesses, places, events, most of the science are either the products of the author's imagination or used in a fictitious manner. Any resemblance purely coincidental, etc. Thank you. Thanks, Rudolph. Quantum Transmission Integrity Verification. Studio Mongoose, the Corporation for Earth Media. And faking this card is a uh, maximum penalty of up to five years in prison and or a $200,000 fine, which uh, means only rich people can do it. Well, let's have some educational content. Oh, and I forgot to say as we were starting, um, thank you, Charities Lady, for the 30-month resub. That is ridiculous. 
Uh, and I appreciate it so much. Thank you. The Corporation for Earth Media is proud to present this educational program. Produced in conjunction with the frontier scientists, engineers, and artists of the Kronos 7 expedition. South Scrimshaw is made possible through the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Tell you what, I'm gonna shrink myself a little bit so I don't get in the way of the subtitles so much. Ooh. There we go, you have to make the noise otherwise it doesn't work. Thank you, PBS. I'm from England and even I know this is a PBS thing. <laughs> Chapter 1. Birth! As ever, starting a new game, let me know if the sound balance is bad or anything, and I will try and fix it and probably fail. Birth, the worst chapter. It, this is flesh, you are, you are correct. I said heavy emphasis on biology, did I not? Nature, red in tooth and flesh, I guess. Hot sunlight shines through the veined membrane of an aquatic egg. There you go, that's what it is. It was once carried in deeper, cooler waters of a more northern latitude. Now it bobs freely in a subtropical shallow. Consciousness dawning inside is prodded alert and discomfort. That's a mood. It's a male whale calf, stirring with a newfound awareness of body. Is this how whale calves look? I guess. My brain doesn't say their fins have this many joints, but, you know. You thought whales didn't lay eggs? Well, here we are. This pod has held him for 17 months, nurtured his development from a single fertilized cell, and now it can no longer support his life. The inflow of nutrients and oxygenated blood has ceased. A once comfortable cradle now pinches at his enlarged form, also a mood. Pushed onto his own faculty, a suffocating urge to thrash wells up inside him. Whale calves like sepultura, you heard it here first. Yet, he hesitates. <clears throat> because I needed to clear my throat. You googled it and it's not not what they look like. Fetal whales have hind limb buds. Okay, that's... That's words we've all seen now. A song booms from the world outside. A powerful, low frequency vibrates through his whole body. With the certainty of deep imprinting, the calf knows who is calling. It is, his it is his mother. She's on the other side. He must join her. The shell containing him is now only a brittle husk, swollen with waste material and straining at the seams. I mean, so are a lot of us. It, it, it was a long pandemic. Clumsy first movements form the start of the calf's motor awareness. The egg has evolved to rupture open along a central seam. A few thin cartilage bands are all that retain him. Why did you think googling this to answer my question was a good idea? Is knowledge a good idea, really? One more forceful effort, and he will escape. Destroy egg. Birth! New slide. The Corporation for Earth Media presents a Studio Mongoose production. South Scrimshaw. Yeah, this is part one, which is the first four chapters, I believe. I think it said that on the title screen as well. Technically speaking, the whale didn't hatch for an egg. 
Embryonic whales show the leg having history of whales more than the adult versions do. That makes sense, to be honest. Like, embryonic humans have a lot more fish traits, so... Branching evolution. That's... I don't know, my diagram of branching evolution, it could go one of two ways. And give you twice as many plus one plus one counters. I've been playing a lot of magic. Uh, technically speaking, the whale didn't hatch from egg. There you go, Emily, there's your answer. Egg is something of a misnomer. While there are no egg-laying ma ma mammals, none of them are whales. Tangent. There are four extant species of egg-laying mammal. They are... The platypus. See figure one. The echidna. I do not have a cuddly one of those, but I do know some upsetting facts about them. This is just what you like the experience of an autistic with a special interest. You're not wrong. Oh hey, that sounds cool. How about I look up every fact related to it that's ever been written by anyone uh, that is available on the internet? <sighs> oh. The snob. I definitely don't have a cuddly snob. And the ribbon snore. I don't want one of those. These sunflowers, yeah, these sunflowers are beautiful. Did you know that sunflowers are not actually a single flower, but combined structure of hundreds of white running away? Cool, we now know more about egg-laying mammals. But none of them are whales. This whale species has a placental connection to the mother while developing. Birthing shell is the term currently favoured in scientific journals when discussing this style of external womb. Those are two words that shouldn't go together. Of course, I saw external womb at Hammerfest supporting... Nope, this joke has run out of steam because I couldn't think of a good metal band for them to be supporting. Bring me the horizon. You thought all non-oviparous mammals had a placental connection to the parent? Yeah, but it's just, I think this placental connection happens to be outside of the body? The outer cartilage folds backwards, shrinking the space inside and expelling the contents outwards. Wait, can I go past? Back? Yes. Creating pressure against the inner membrane until it finally pops. The calf spills out into the open ocean. External placenta is an awful concept. Yep. You're not wrong. <laughs> the world is a rush of sensory stimulation. The newborn is momentarily stunned limp. What is this weird mushroom snail? I love it. He comes to amid a dizzying flurry of life. Plants and protists tangle and snag his every movement. Protist isn't a word you hear particularly often. I like it. Small scavengers eagerly devour the cloud of waste. Hi, hi Twitch chat. I'm sorry, I could not. Plants unfurl and retract in almost animalistic locomotion. Protest is the coolest sounding kingdom. You are correct. All the other kingdoms are amateurs. Foliage clings to the calf from above. He swims deeper to escape. His mother's song reassures him once again, but she is still nowhere in sight. Sponges, wharf biters, crustaceans, and corals dangle from the plants like ornaments. We're about to learn more about plants, but first, 
I would like to point out that this is clearly a year. Look, you are not going to interrupt my jokes with actual technical knowledge. I mean, you probably are, but hey. But hey, about the plants. Plant is not a misnomer, these are true plants. As with so much else in biology, the origin of plants can be traced back to the water. Albeit, those early ancestors were far less complex than what we see today. As will be explained later, marine environments impose steep challenges on plants. Fish dress goes with game choice. That is actually a complete accident. I had planned this game, like, for the last couple of weeks since I heard about it coming out. Uh, and the dress just happened to turn up this morning, so... Fish dress, fish game, it's all good. But yes, marine environments impose steep challenges on plants. Marine environments impose steep challenges on most things. The sea, not particularly friendly. It was once upon land, freed from the burdens of an aquatic life, that plants could more readily diversify and form. It's a choice net no. Not everything is a choice, especially in my life. We are creatures of chaos. And it was also after that great proliferation of flowering species that some plants found it more favourable by the water, and eventually returned to the seas. They are, in that sense, like whales. That's simultaneously philosophical and just a cool scientific thing. Anyway, something solid grabs from below. His descent is halted. These actually look like seaweed, which are no, not plants. Yes, but these these are these aren't algae. These actually are plants. Honestly, we just had a tangent about it. Pay attention. He's being lifted back toward the surface. Yeah, that is absolutely a year. Breach. The calf breaches, filling his lungs with their first breath of air. This is the breeding ground of his species. At the year's peak, this wide expanse fills with whales. You don't trust a whale's understanding of biological phyla? Yeah, well, you're not being told it by the whale. You're being told it by the narrator. And if you can't trust the narrator of nature documentaries, then my entire life has been a lie. But today, our calf finds the surface empty. Except for a very odd clump of plants. Think of the lemmings. No, because that falls into Don't Trust Disney, which is a different lesson. The calf does not know what to make of it. Equally disturbed and compelled mood, he stares transfixed. Plants continue t to tickle his body just below the water. A resident water bug examines him with equal scepticism. Sudden movement atop the leafy mass catches his eye. Hello? Ah! Cool. We've all been jump scared by a heron now. It's all too frightening for the little one. He retreats back under the surface. His overpowering instinct is to nurse, but he cannot. His exhaustion mounts and fear seizes him. He's lost. And as if sensing his weakness, tendrils begin to grasp at him. A vine lassoes his flute. There's no escape. 
In a final burst of strength, the car fights, thrashing, tearing, and uprooting his attackers. The scent of blood enters the water. His mother cries a pained song to soothe him. Calf is hit with the sudden realization. The strange plants are not taking him away from his mother. The strange plant clod is his mother. Okay. God, this art is gorgeous, though. L look, look at this. Look at this. This is this is beautiful. The Brillo Way, Bistrixiana Silvefera. I mean, Silvefera is like wood bearing, and presumably named after somebody named Bistrix. Which, what's pistol? That's a word. Could we f yeah, yeah, no, I... I meant wood as in forest. Yes. Yes, because Silvus is definitely wood as in forest, as in collection of trees, rather than wood as in material. Uh... But yeah, I honestly, I couldn't remember the word forest, so there's that. God, I should know what pistol means. It's been a while. Nope, I'm sure somebody in chat will tell me. Anyway, here's chapter two, anatomy. Yes, pistol. In Latin, because it was named because it was Pistrixiana, the genus, so presumably named after somebody named Pistrix, which would be the feminine form of pistol. Spelt grinder. Interesting. Yes, uh, yes. I think it's it can be grinders in general because I think that's why a piston's called a piston because it operates kind of like that. Or a miller or a baker, yeah. Yeah, yeah, miller would, I believe, be the most usual translation. Anyway, I'm getting distracted by languages, as I do most of the time. What evidence remained of this year's Brillo breeding system, system season has long since been swept away. This sandbar has returned to its normal pristine state, except for this one rock. Get it out of there. So for one unusual pile of rocks, there we go. We're scanning it. Very aggressive scan, that felt like. This is a stone dog. Of course. Honestly, can you not recognise a stone dog when you see it? Somewhat like a hermit crab. This animal lives in a portable shelter of foreign material. You know what else is somewhat like a hermit crab? Uh, this sculpture of a hermit crab I just got. It's been a good vacation for me coming back with weird but very on-brand things, and that's one of them. Anyway, portable shelter of foreign material. It grasps together a shell of sca- Bleh, 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 bleh. Take two. It grasps together a shell of sha- It grasps together a shell of scavenged debris with its long limbs and secretes an adhesive mucus to hold it fast. Too many sibilants? Yeah. Bane of my life. Stone dogs mostly rely on ambushing prey from a camouflaged position. Right now, this stone dog here is not the hunter, but the hunted. It's a woefully obvious attempt to hide. It's like if you're playing Dark Souls and somebody uses the chameleon spell and then it's just like a vase scooting about in the middle of an empty room. As the predator stalking it possesses one of the sharpest minds in the ocean. Oh. 
Okay, that's very cute. A quick check if the coast is clear. It isn't. A whale calf wants to play, not eat. But from the stone dog's perspective, there's little difference. Yeah, if something 50 times your size wants to play with you, then you're not you're still not going to have a good time. Since hatching, our calf has been a healthy and energetic specimen. Despite his late birth, no complications are detectable. If anything, his cognitive ability is showing swift advancement. Smart combined with oceanic life form is usually a threat. Yeah. I mean, hi orcas, if any of you are watching Twitch, which frankly at this rate you probably are. He's very fond of holding his fluke above the water surface. Scattered showers are currently moving through the area. The calf has been emerging frequently for visual inspection since the rain began. You're pro walker? Oh yeah, same, 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 same. They're just reminding us that the sea is not for us, which we knew. He seems very interested in the weather above. A long call reminds him not to stray too far. Oh yeah, there's mum in the background. Brillos have surprisingly keen vision above the water. Calf is quickly able to spot his mother. This is the farthest distance he's travelled from her. It's more than twice that of yesterday. Today was quite an adventure. Now, reminded of his mother, all this bravery seems to evaporate. He's suddenly anxious to be at her side. He'll bring her any interesting objects discovered while exploring. Such as this little guy. And boot it at her face. I mean, is that not the truest love language? Oh my god, I just noticed her eye. Sorry, that just surprised me a bit. Up there. His mother is trying to rest off another bout of nausea. This play is a bit much. Oh, But these discomforts are trivial to the bond between mother and child. Our neural interface even shows a measurable relief in her symptoms during these interactions. Why do you have a neural interface implanted in these? The calf's carefree play is training for future hunts and the essential skills of survival. But it will be some time before he has to worry about earning meals on his own. His mother's long prehensile udders, that's another very bad pair of words. Well, we've all gone to a place now. Reach him through the thorny bramble. The milk he nurses on is thick as yoghurt. Calves subsist on this fat-rich diet for two years, building up an insulating layer of blubber. <laughs> There's simply so many words in this. Yes, and two of them were prehensile udders. <laughs> and the bands of spongy tissue for other organisms to bury, burrow into. Which is why she's covered in plants. Okay. Here we arrive at what truly makes a Brillo whale such a remarkable specimen for study. Symbiosis of unrivaled complexity and variety. This female was initially selected for study due to her exquisitely beautiful exterior. The mammal almost totally concealed within the undulating botanical mass. And I saw the undulating botanical mass supporting the Mars Volta. I've played this joke too much. In cross-section, the distinction between whale and passenger is more visible. Also. Are they actually symbiotic or are they commensal? Like, the pedant in me wants to know. 
Oh, back on scan mode. In which we need eight coils now. That certainly is a thing. I mean, I've never seen an x-ray of an actual whale, I suppose. Unlike the stone dog shown earlier, this is not simply an external attachment of foreign material. Standard whale skeleton? Well, for t toothed whales at least, yeah. The Brillo whale has an intimate connection to thousands of other living creatures. Sure, when a whale has an intimate connection to thousands of other living creatures, it's fine, but when I do it... I mean, I don't, so... It's called Twitch. God, I... Please, if I had thousands of other living creatures in chat, that would be a very different... day. Zoom, enhance. The whale chooses from among a variety of partner species. It's the Dermis habitat and offers real estate within designated regions of its body, like the Dermis habitat. And there's a protective cuticle underneath it, which makes sense. An inner membrane draws the line between the welcome cohabitation space and the whale's vitals. This unusual arrangement raises several questions, the first of which we will address, but none of the others. Whale? But whale. Hey, there's that CPU chug. Seriously, I wish I could work out how to stop this happening. And here we are. It'll go away, and visual novels don't worry that much about it. But what is the benefit of living on a whale? I've often asked this. To help us illustrate the principle, we'll be assisted by a sea bunny, or sea bun to use its more common nickname. We are absolutely going on a tangent about the sea bun. The South Scrimshaw team has received very explicit direction from our producers and we are to unequivocally clarify to viewers that the sea bun is not a real animal. I mean, even the whale looks sad about that. I mean, I do appreciate a documentary that says this part of our documentary lies in fabrication. Everything else you find. The sea bar owes its creation to the original landing party of Kronos V. Though the specifics are lost, the most convincing story is that it was something misheard over a shoddy radio connection. As those early years recede into contemporary legend, it's important to remember that the tales of hardship told by the first landing party are not exaggerated. Pioneers were indeed isolated for 11 solar cycles, and it was not until the conclusion of the hostilities on Earth that the current biannual delivery schedule could be planned. Capital H Hostilities. That says a lot. The uncharted planet was a land of mysterious fauna and unknown environmental hazards. This tangent about the sea bun has led to delightful world building. Yes, this is another thing I'd heard from a lot of people about this, was that there's so much kind of incidental world building in it, which is the best kind, I find. Various examples of sea bun doodles and graffiti. Adorable. It was a time where technology seemed to suffer inexplicable malfunctions, while repair efforts were always undermined by a constant lack of materials, tools, and manpower. The myth of the sea bun serves as a caricature for the force of chaos always at work when one's back is turned. The fish one is your favourite. That tracks. That one's my favourite. The Crazy Harry one. Sea bunnies was just a sort of shorthand for I don't know what's wrong, it could be anything, including a cryptid. Among our seniors who were present at the time, one likened the expression to Here be dragons on medieval maps, another drew a parallel with Murphy's Law. 
That is the Loch Ness Monster with rabbit ears. Somewhere along the line, either as intentional jokes or honest mis misunderstanding with colourful communiques, word of sea bunnies repeatedly escaped the planet in a way interpreted as fact by those off-world. Compounding this inf misinformation was a popular hazing ritual, and new arrivals were assigned to catch a sea bun for research, usually being given a butterfly net and sent somewhere isolated and moderately dangerous. The unique culture planet side encouraged the escalation of this practice, until a few near disasters brought a legislative end to the budding tradition. I've got to read this. To Redacted from Redacted. I know you guys already understand the gravity of this situation, and I know there isn't malice behind these sorts of pranks, so we'll skip the part where I scold you like children, but understand that I'm mostly planet side, so brass isn't. They aren't in a position to understand how some FNG got, some, got sent on a literal wild goose chase and swept away by the tide. We, were, we are all so lucky that fishing boat was there to pick him out of the drink. This case is getting closed without any disciplinary sanctions. Helps that the kid's being a sport about it. Regardless, I need everyone at your outpost to consider themselves on probation. They gave some personal assurances to secure this outcome, so my neck is on the line too. Send my regards to Redacted. He was saying the other day how we haven't seen you two for a while. Let's get some horseshoes in before the weather cools. Regards. Redacted. And you should send my regards to Redacted. Were you reading all of that during your stand-up meeting? Excellent. Unofficial emblem frequently used to mark construction equipment. Sea bunny's not allowed. Regular infrastructure improvements have also blunted the disgruntled sarcasm towards occasional hardship. Ah. In recent years, the sea bunny is most defined by Will Voynich's cartoons. Tangent within a tangent. Kids Wilderness. Kids Wilderness is a monthly publication created and edited by Will Voynich, written and illustrated by Voynich and various contributors. It's written and illustrated by him, so you could call it a Voynich manuscript. Using friendly illustrations, it focuses on natural science, camping, health and wellness. It joins the official Sunday newspaper as one of the planet's only two print publications. Okay, there's a lot in there. A, two print publications left in the world. B, one of them is a kid's cartoon. C, the Sunday newspaper. The Sunday newspaper. There is one. It's a shout out to highlights. I don't know that reference. Voynich was originally a cartographer, and among those first to land with Chronos V. Children's literature only became a guiding passion after he discovered himself a soon-to-be father. He realised how very little would be available to the new generation by way of age-appropriate entertainment and education. What was that? Hi. Excuse me one moment, having some sea bunnies of my own. <sighs> okay. That happened. No, that that was a bunch of cables. Uh, I have a very interesting cable management stra strategy here, and involving cardboard boxes and yeah, leads extended far too far, and I think I must have just knocked one of them and it was pulling the whole thing over. And no, Daniel's contract he takes pains to remind me explicitly excludes anything about cable management. Which I thought was weird, but I mean, I guess he wrote the contract, he knows what he's doing. 
Anyway. About age-appropriate entertainment and education. Daniel's striking in solidarity. Please. Bears aren't unionized. I've just received terrible news. Too bad he's a ghost and this isn't a union set. Daniel isn't a ghost. Dan Daniel's a bear. We've been over this. On off hours at the Cartographic Survey Computer Lab, using optical scanners and image editing software designed for map making, Voynich painstakingly constructed his first works. He will be when you're done with him. No, you... Look. I will indulge most of your tangents, but you are not picking a fight with Daniel. He works very hard, and without him, would this stream even be here? And yes, Daniel is canonically uh, an Ikea stuffed bear. And it's spelled with a lowercase d. Do I remember why that is? No. <laughs> This is deep lore. This is going back to one of my earlier blogs, and it's just become a thing over here. I, I can only apologise. <laughs> anyway, about Will Voynich. Yikes. Five volumes containing every fable he could remember from his old childhood. Oh, hey, it's the fox and the grapes. While he faithfully retells many of these timeless classics, Voynich's recall is... Often hazy. Other plushies like crab are crab. I mean, there is a plushie crab. It's not called crab. The, 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 the crab I just showed on camera is a, like, wood and metal sculpture. I have many crabs. Only one of them is a plush, and their name is Stevani. Because, uh, it was a recurring thread where... All of our matching crabs were named after elaborate anagrams of Minnesota Timberwolves. Can I remember the full reasoning for that? No, I cannot. In full, it's, um, what is it? Is it Miss Stavoni Bowtie Slam? It's definitely Stavoni Bowtie Slam. It must be Mr. Because you can't get the R in otherwise. Cool. Yes, there you go, Lord Drop. <laughs> Me and a bunch of my friends have matching crabs and they all have elaborate names that are anagrams of Minnesota Timberwolves, like Baron Swimley Von Teets. As I've said on Discord before to those of you who are there, um, one of my friends is the best person for anagrams I have ever seen. And he came up with all of these, and they're uh, spectacular. Anyway, should we actually get on with this game rather than just talking about plushes I own and in-jokes I've established around them? No, Daniel, I know I don't actually own you. That's also specified in the contract, which I thought, again, was a strange thing to have to say. Several of the stories are so misremembered that they're more original work than adaptations. For example, the elephant and the mouse retains nothing from the Aesop tale besides the titular animals. Voynich's version has the two discussing the different sorts of dreams they have while sleeping. Voynich's first intentional works of fiction would be penned for Kid's Wilderness. I love that, fr that phrasing, intentional works of fiction. Like... He made these things that were technically original works, but he didn't mean to, so did they count? There's an interesting epistemological thread in there. The Adventures of Seaban and Monaco. The Adventures of Seaban and Monaco, number four. Seaban eats the telecommunication network. Oh, that rascal. The accessible charm of Seabarn and Monaco found an immediate and enthusiastic audience. I mean, you can see why, especially if it came with this accordion music. It's a comic about a tech gremlin. Absolutely, yes. 
there you go, currently playing our musical arrangements from the Puppet Show adaptation, which has been touring schoolhouses. The songs were composed and performed by Nico Kuprin. The formula of each adventure largely follows the same beats. I mean, yeah, that's most kids' comics. Seaburn, an ocean sprite with impish curiosity and an endless appetite for inedible material, happens upon some unknown piece of infrastructure and decides to devour it. Meanwhile, Monaco, a nervous eel sidekick who always follows Seabun, watches on in comically exaggerated terror while imagining the most nightmarish possible outcomes. These predictions of doom never come to pass. But Seabun's actions do cause significant damage, forcing construction crews to deploy for repairs. Seabun, now realising his error, uses his supernatural strength to help workers in various ways and atones for his destructive acts. Everything is then rebuilt stronger than before. As formulas go, it's a solid one. The story formula seeks to inform young readers about vital infrastructure, where it's found, what happens if it breaks, and the sort of specialised work that maintenance requires. I like this. It also seeks to make the harsh edges of a frontier life less frightening and unknown to young readers. Each story ends with the sleepy sea bun returning to his burrow with a souvenir, where he slumbers peacefully. That is, until he gets hungry again. Just got the achievement, Deepest Lore, Research the Sea Bunny. <laughs> yes, that was very important for us all to know. <laughs> anyway, back to the first level of Tangent. Given how entrenched the character has become in the popular consciousness here, we feel it appropriate that the Sea Bun help guide our exploration of these oceans. So... Yes, uh, where were we? Whale biology, that was a thing. While each species has its own unique adaptation to this niche lifestyle, we can create several broad categories of benefits such evolution aims to harness. Hydrate and stretch, you make a good point. We've been doing tangents, and those take it out of you. Which I say is a joke, but also just words, I suppose. Moving through water takes energy. It's far easier to travel great distance when someone else is doing the swimming. Simply hitching a ride can be greatly beneficial. For example, one species of crab... Crab only lives on Brillo whales every other generation, and uses whale transportation to greatly expand its range. Unless one is the apex predator, the threat of being eaten is an ever-present reality. If one lives as a potential meal, it's very important to be the least desirable, most difficult of meals. Finding alliance with a giant beast and living under its protection creates a very effective deterrence. It's always still possible to be eaten. I mean, it's always possible to be eaten. But hunters now risk facing off with a leviathan. Some partnerships are more proactive. Certain sharks, skates, rays and scarps. One of these things not like the others. Have formed hunting partnership with the brillos and gross eating noises. They help find and catch quarry, then share in the feast. Pack hunting allows the Brillo to take down larger and different sorts of prey. The blood or waste of Brillo whales can also provide a source of nourishment. This is not offered freely, obviously a Brillo whale cannot stand to be eaten alive. An earth parallel is an oxpecker bird and a rhinoceros. The bird may drink a marginal amount of blood while it cleans off ticks. It's a fair trade for the rhinoceros as the tick is the far greater threat. Again, I don't think that's technically symbiosis, I think that's commensality. But that's a distinction that few people make, I suppose. So too will a Brillo whale expend blood in a beneficial relationship. In several instances, living on a Brillo has evolved into part of an organism's life cycle, and the specific conditions regulated in a Brillo's body are required for a new generation. In some cases, this goes even further. Yeah! E even the whale is horrified. 
With the biology of the two species becoming so enmeshed, it's unclear where one ends and the other begins. <laughs> but these instances are rare. Oh, that rascally seabird. Our research team is very interested if these extreme cases represent a functioning system or the pathological eventuality to such complicated arrangements. All of these riders taking in small amounts adds up to a great expense for the host. This prompts the obvious next question. What does the whale stand to benefit from this arrangement? This is more complicated to respond to. There seem to be as many answers as there are Brillo whales, as there is spectacular variety among Brillos. For now, let us approach the answer with specific examples from this mother. The most prominent feature along her body is the wide variety of photosynthesizing organisms. The whale is, of course, not an autotroph, producing her own energy from sunlight. But the specialized sea flora pays rent by sharing some of their sugars into her blood. When light is low, roots ferment and alcohol is also created as a byproduct. Certain plants near her head also act as fishing lures, drawing food to her more. Or she may occasionally swim deeper. A partially plant-subsidized life has locked her within the photic zone, the upper aquatic layer where enough sunlight can sustain the leaves. Adult Brillo behavior and biology is often dramatically influenced by the symbiotic arrangement. Here we see a blood trilobite. Who I saw support- no, let's not. This is not an invited guest. A long, needle-like proboscis pushes down, taps a vein. Blood trial is my next powered by the apocalypse system. I'd play it. Well, no, I'd buy it and say this looks really good, I should play it sometime. I'm just reading myself at this point. Drinking in great volume and offering nothing in return is a true parasite. This is a job for the vellum worm. Vellum worms fill their stomachs by grooming brillos of unwanted visitors. It's currently hypothesized that vellum worms distinguish the welcome from the attackers through smell and taste. Parasites have all been found to have elevated amounts of a bile-like brillo waste inside them. That's interesting, just like they've evolved so that the brillo, like, deliberately secretes a marker chemical when it's being parasitized. That's a neat idea. This mother Brillo also has to worry about creatures browsing her lovely plants. Herbivorous fish attempt frequent raids on the leafy goods. This one's alone and quite oblivious. The vellum worm packs a powerful punch for larger animals. A neurotoxin filled barb is shot into the fish's heart. Jesus. Can only manage a faint muscle spasm before the venom completes its work. Wow, vellum worms go hard. The Brillo whale's strategy is called a symbiotic garden. It's an intel intentionally cultivated arrangement and a precarious balance of mutual reliance. When successfully maintained, the host becomes a morass of life. It's usually defended from attack, it can sometimes acquire energy in novel ways, occasionally it's able to invade new niche ecosystems. The universal downside experienced by all Brillos is that more complexity creates more points for failure. I mean that's the universal downside experienced by all of us, all the time. That's just life. An adult Brillo's life is dominated by the struggle to groom a semblance of order into increasingly overgrown flanks. To a certain calf, these adult problems have yet to enter his mind. Today, he has found his mother's leaves serve as fun streamers to play with. I mean, speaking of fun streamers to play with, hi Twitch Chad. She finally scolds him. She's too unwell to tolerate any more roughhousing. Oh, look at him. He doesn't quite understand. 
He has other diversions. Primarily, drinking more of her milk. Okay, uh, this is rad. Uh, I need to take a break, though. So, can I... Sweet. I will save, just in case. Because I do not believe all the tech gremlins can be gone. Uh, yeah. So... I need to take a break. Uh, I will go and get some water and... I don't know, probably eat something. And just generally get up and run some ads. And I recommend all of you do most of the same things. Have some water, have a snack, take your meds if you still need to. This is a reminder. Uh, and... Yeah, go and say hello to a human. Let the ads run, if you can. Can you have a C-bun emoji? I can see what I can do. And yeah. Uh... I think I've said all the things I usually do. Uh, yeah, let the ads run if you can, and we will be back in a few minutes for more of this. Love you all. See you in a few. And we're back. Sorry for the... What? Well, I sure am glad I saved. See, Bun! Yep, yeah, that, that's entirely crashed. Neat! <laughs> this is why I saved. Yes, yeah, sorry for the slightly longer than planned break. I had a Samosa to eat and design proofs to sign off on. The life I lead. Where were we? Given the complexity of Brillo anatomy, even small health problems can swiftly spiral out of control. This female experienced complications while giving birth. There is the potential for the situation to worsen. A thorned branch has become ingrown, puncturing through both the layer of protective outer muscle and the cuticle barrier. Yeah. Ingrown is just never a word you want to hear frankly. This had begun prior to carving, but her contractions to extend the womb also caused the plant shard to stab deeper. The spikes are now in contact with her intestines. Fortunately, there is no puncture yet. The site is inflamed, and white blood cells flood the area. The immune system unmistakably identifies this as an injury. We can witness her stiff reluctance to move and You'd have jolt in brain activity when she's jostled. It must be greatly painful. The greatest danger right now is a tear of the intestines, which would certainly be fatal. There is reason to hope. Our scans also reveal that she's recovered from a similar injury in the past. Perhaps Brillo's regularly endure such ghastly wounds. Perhaps it was the safety of the Brillo herd which afforded her enough time to convalesce. Certainly her odds of survival will be boosted greatly if she's able to make the long swim back. For now, she is still well enough to care for her newborn, though doing so must be exhausting. But he's very cute, though. Judging by several physical indicators, this is most likely her first calf. Those brillos who manage their gardens well can be extremely long-lived. Females can give birth as many as eight times. If the calf survives, one day he too might also cast his genes forward, his own minute fingerprint on the future's shape. Regardless of whatever metric of success we observers of an outside species might apply, his life will be led by the means it was forged in the crucible of natural selection. But for now, a rare moment of shelter. There's something kind of Studio Ghibli about this, and I don't know exactly why. Chapter 3, Departing.
beauty and danger, yeah, and the way they draw the plants, these are both valid answers. This is a simplified map of the local ocean topography. The deep blue represents a fault line, a planetary scar where two tectonic plates meet. As with Earth, this land is a moving crust atop a globe of molten metal. The planet-shaping force of subduction pushed ground up above the sea. I mean, did it, or did it push the sea plate underneath the land, please? It's subduction for a reason. A lot of Ghibli films, especially Miyazaki, are whimsical, but also deadly dangerous. Yep, uh, yeah, that's that, an extremely valid analysis, yeah, to be honest. Creating what is now named the Chartres Archipelago. The 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 island chain runs for about 870 kilometers, drawing a ragged line away from the continent. These are all great place names. These names were given by an early survey team assessing the grounds for a harbor or research outpost. Fe it feels like the colonists were British, just from some of those names. Kick Light a Point and Hogback. But I don't know. I don't know where this developer's from. A body of water created between the Scrimshaw Islands. It's known as the Thallow Bay. The large inlet is exactly what a Brillo whale breeding ground requires, but let's find out more about that. Regarding Brillo carving, the most important feature of the bay is the chemical composition and concentration of fungal spores. You ignored this bit. This is the shape of the Caribbean. For now, we will limit our discussion to the choreography of the breeding ground. <clears throat> Three separate herds converged this year to give birth simultaneously. The dots estimate their prior positions. Not all Brillos make this trek every year, but many more whales assist besides parents. You know what they say, it takes a pod to raise a calf. Pregnant whales move into the centre, where they maintain as much distance from one another as possible, which makes a lot of sense when you have an external womb. Perhaps due to the unpredictable anatomy of their fellow Brillos, or a vulnerability, vulnerability in the skin of the newborns, calves are kept segregated from all others for the first months of their life. The remaining herd forms a blockade at the mouth of the bay while the pregnant whales deliver. As weeks pass, hunger and distraction start to erode focus on this task. The amount of time that the herd can wait is finite. When the time comes, all leave together at once, moving with the safety of numbers. Their destination will be one of several coral reefs. Those unable to move on time must be abandoned. Oh no. The healthy cannot hazard everyone's odds of survival for the sake of a few infirm. I mean, I get that, but at the same time, oh no. Our mother, wounded as she is, is one of several this year who befell this fate. That was a sad tangent. Outside of that season, the whales live elsewhere. Usually they're found at coral reefs and areas more productive with food. Brillos require a very high calorie diet. I mean, yeah, when you're eating for 40. We now find our whales here, at the border to the Great Vathis Ocean. That's the one I don't get so far. Chartres Archipelago makes sense because of the colour. Thalo Bay makes sense because of the colour. I don't get the reference in Vathis. Because, I mean, Tethys is like the primordial ocean uh, between Eurasia and Gondwana land, but... Not sure about the reference. Anyway, it's a bright day in early autumn. 
An unseasonable cold front chills the air. The clocks were striking 13. Below the surface, we find our mother bracing for the journey and looking even more overgrown. Judging by her mobility, her health is much improved. The delay is likely not related to her recovering wounds. The distance between the Fallow Bay and the Southern Reef is inhabited by many large predators. Many Brillo calves are taken in these waters. That Vathis with a V. Yeah, yeah. Ba if it was Bathy, it would just be deep. But yeah, no, Vathis. Her loud songs are searching for another Brillo's response. She's been making these calls since before dawn. She does not want to make this journey, journey alone. What is it? 47 hertz, the lonely, the famous lonely whale sound. Greek beta is a labial, might have just, might have been conflated, conflated, yeah, Vathis versus Vathis, yeah. I mean. Me, you get far too distracted by the linguistics of names, never happened before. Onomastics. The calf returns with a fresh lung full of oxygen. And is adorable. And quickly retreats back to the bramble under his mother. For once he does not need to be told to stay close. I'm having Echo the Dolphin flashbacks. God. There, there's a thing that happened in my childhood. And if you've never played Echo the Dolphin, it's surprisingly messed up. Undoubtedly, he can also read the change in his mother's behaviour. IPA offers 15th century late Greek Vathis, Vath, Vath, yeah, Vathis, yeah, so, yeah, makes sense. And the unfamiliar place ahead is deeper and colder. Faintly at first, a new sound reaches them. His mother startles. They both listen. It's another whale. A brillo whale. And it's getting nearer. Our mother booms a reply back. I'm getting very bad vibes here. Calf's curious nature starts to show itself again. He has yet to meet a brillo besides his mother. There, he spots something. A large body begins to emerge from the hazy distance. It continues to approach, but the calf still can't quite understand what he's looking at. The calf's curiosity morphs into discomfort the closer it gets. Discomfort turns into outright alarm. And an, speaking of uh, aesthetic studio Ghibli things, just that facial expression, that's a Ghibli protagonist right there. He pleads to his mother in distress. She rebukes him in reply as if to say, don't be rude to the new neighbours. One cannot blame him for his confusion. That's a lot. This Brillo whale's appearance was shaped to be deceptive. It's a beautiful and ghastly example of mimicry. The way the jaws gently undulate is startling, startlingly believable. The grim exterior is the work of an important symbiotic partner. This guy. The Weaver Lobe. Ah, I was going to go with George. Fine, if he's already got the name. 
These prodigious builders turned their colonies into terrifying scarecrows by spinning and sculpting Osama, which we are going to read about. Sidebar. Osama is a long-chain polymer found in great abundance here. It's totally novel to our researchers. I don't know why red text kind of sounds like Jake Thackeray, but that's the voice we're going with. When soft, similar in texture to a neoprene diving suit. The curing process can be hardened to various levels. In its stiffest state, it resembles the chitin shell of a beetle. The second documentary team is currently compiling all of the latest discoveries, but what about them? What about those people? Screw the people we're actually following, what about different people? Corporation for Earth Media presents Building Bugs. Don't know what that voice was. Building Bugs. This multi-part series will focus exclusively on the insect world, which sees far more divergent evolution from Earth species than vertebrates. The title reflects... The title refers both to insects that build habitats, and the evolutionary forces which likely constructed such insects. Good to know. Coming this autumn on PBS. Until then, we hope our simple introduction to this material suffices. Cool, it's, it's, it's just bone thread, which is what we could pretty much have gathered from Osama, I suppose. Water is channeled through the layer layered construction, swelling and emptying various pockets, creating animal-like locomotion. Our resident weaver lobe expert insists that the beastly facade before us here should have taken many decades to complete. It also seems unlikely that it was built from scratch on the way it was back. Perhaps if weaver lobes are able to relocate such structures, an established colony was simply carried onto the Brillo's back. Such fearsome appearance does much to ward off predators. The reversed head may also help to confuse prey. Oh, that? Is, is this the head? Yeah, looking at the direction of the tentacle. Oh, th there's an eye! Okay, success, I suppose. We do not know why she was left behind, but this Brillo was a valuable addition to the ocean crossing. She too is a mother, looking to deliver her child to safety. It seems that all Brillo calves are quite shy around new acquaintances. Our calf growls to himself. I mean, when you're the kind of megafauna that is, by necessity, kind of living in as in kind of individuals or in very small family groups and just not. You're not going to see many more of your own species, so that makes sense. Scoldings are unlikely to budge his unwelcoming attitude. Or will the surprise of additional friends. The calf was so distracted by what was in front of him. But he failed to notice what was swimming up from behind, oh no. Wow. She's something like a faceless stone golem. The exterior is more bizarre than menacing. It might serve as some kind of armour, but our crew is at a loss to describe it on first sight. Like our Brillo mother, this whale may also have some kind of internal injury. She's only able to produce short, abrupt honks instead of complex songs. She is also a mother. Regardless of what benefit her exterior provides, her presence alone will help contribute to a safe crossing. Flanked by these strangers, our calf seems very disturbed. New experiences may be uncomfortable now, but they will lead him to understand the Brillo way. Which is a martial art using scouring pads. Really, I've waited this entire game to make a Brillo pad joke, and that's what I went with. Sure, I guess. <sighs> His mother jolts him forward with a shove of her branches. It's unlikely that more companions will show up, and 
There's no time left to delay. All following her lead, the six whales head out into the ocean to find their lost herd. Drama. The pod is now 57 kilometers from the Great Southern Reef. And for those of you watching in America, that's what? Uh, I can do this in my head. Right? About 35 miles? This is the final leg of their journey, and their path crosses over a wide abyssal trench. The parent whales set the pace at a rigorous 6 kilometers an hour. They swim in a typical defensive formation, though with only three adults it's not possible to fully encircle the youths. The trek has been arduous for our little calf, but he's endured it with admirable stoicism. Slowing down is not an option. He's able to sense this himself. Something large has been following the whales. First appeared in the early afternoon and has maintained the same steady distance ever since. Hours passed and the mysterious animal failed to approach or make any concerning moves. Just watching you, Zazki. Calf's fear of the unknown was slowly overtaken again by interest in his new Brillo companions. The stony skinned mother whale and her calf now swim to his left flank. This calf was whining earlier but seems to have calmed. The stony mother's outer surface has slowly morphed shape throughout the day, greatly, greatly reducing its size. It's as if the exterior nodules are deflating. What mechanism triggers this change, or how they shrink, we do not know. Overall, she is slightly more streamlined in form than earlier. Perhaps she can intentionally contract her shell for extra mobility. Frankly, more documentaries should be like, this happens for some reason, we're not sure, but we're working on it. Our calf doesn't know what to make of her either, I accidentally right-clicked. Below him swim the mimic mother whale and her calf. Along with one of our semi-autonomous light drones. You don't just show the equipment on camera, but hey, while you are doing, let's read about it. Since, since the autonomous side of the semi-autonomous drone has chosen to enter frame and spoil the shot, this seems an appropriate moment to talk about some of the machines used in South Scrimshaw's production. Almost all of our remote operated vehicles, or ROVs, are surplus from the pacification war. Excuse me? When the self-appointed International Co Coalition declared Earth's intention to globally adopt the Doctrine of Resistance, they provoked the construction of a war drone fleet. An army of multi-purpose and single-purpose robots was fabricated in less than five days. That is a war crime. Thank you! Oof. The system works! I didn't have to press the button! Oof. Due to the brevity of the conflict, mostly between Earth factions, and the eventual unconditional capitulation offered, almost none of these war machines saw deployment. Today all can agree that avoiding a protracted land invasion or an apocalyptic scenario such as kinetic bombardment was a necessity. Sure it was. Today these robots represent progress and optimism instead of death and coercion. Their strike platforms decommissioned and AI reprogrammed, they are now tools of education and discovery. This declassified schematic illustrates just one of the wonderful drones at our disposal. 
I mean, it's not that much of a schematic. It just says light. Click to page two slides. Okay, I can do that. Light diffusing outer shell. But inside, an array of 500 watt LED chips. And inside that, an engine. And a drivetrain. And a water intake. And an impeller. All of these things work together to make the thing what moves. And diffuser planes. And a steering nozzle. And a reverse divider. And a retroencabulator. Is that a thing? Has this been a word that I've just never heard because it's a very niche bit of kit? I'm gonna say they made that up. Get out of here, retroencabulator. Capacitive directant drivers. I mean, this is just your power source, so... Sci-fi power source, that's fine. Force flight weapon platform. Decommissioned. Prefamulated amulite battery unit. Prefamulated amulite. I genuinely kind of love that. I, I love techno babble sometimes. Seawater cooling system and ballast connection. AI. We thank the Chronos 7 leadership for their continued logistical support of our project. Swimming upside down is the most uncomfortable spot for Brillo, and the Mimic Mother refused to take her turn until minutes ago. Her stubbornness may not be entirely unreasonable. While upside down, her disguise as a wide-jawed monster appears to fall apart. The illusion of a toothy beast is currently broken. Arkaf gets a reassuring hum from his mother. This always seems to quell his unease. He is safe within her nest of thorns. He must focus on swimming. But it's hard to ignore that ominous thing in the distance. Because it kind of looks like a pike and those are bad news. This is a penumbra shark. It's the fastest marine animal on the planet. Okay, so worse. For the penumbra, six kilometers an hour is a leisurely pace. It could comfortably stalk the whales for days on end. Assistance hunting? That's our thing. An apex hunter, patient with experience, it will preserve all possible energy for an opportune strike. Very much like a sailfish, penumbra sharks have a large dorsal fin along their back. This is kept retracted until the moment of attack. Welp. Goodbye. With several flicks of the tail, it vanishes from sight. Panic overtakes the whales, and the defensive formation immediately breaks apart. Which is ironic, really. A calf looks down. The mimic mother has abandoned her post. Nothing stands between our calf and the open abyss below. <sighs> Jesus. And now we are in the last couple episodes of Evangelion. <laughs> the fight or flight reaction is as intense as it is instantaneous. Intensaneous. No, no. A full threat alarm floods from the hypothalamus, shooting through every nerve and chemical pathway. Adrenaline pumps into blood. Perception of time dilates. Details of the world suddenly stand out with vivid intensity, even in this low light. Two rows of white teeth are searingly clear. The calf finds his own fins now move in slow motion too. Instant intensity. Instance, in, in, instancity? Maybe? Seawater suddenly feels solid, suspending him in place. Trapped in harm's way, he can only watch the events unfold. Until a tremble runs through the thorns surrounding him. The mother's branches are held under tension and can be released with the force of a catapult. Nice. She flexes, cord snap, 
and in an instant the calf is swaddled in protective barbs and makeshift spears. The shark senses the change and shifts the attack direction to the stone mother's calf is exposed and helpless. Our calf momentarily loses consciousness, but the barbed vines around him act as a net. His mother whisks him away with her. As our calf comes to again, he finds an awful scent filling the water. He looks back to see what happened to his travel companion. Yeah, that was loud. Sight horrifies. It's the reality of predation from the perspective of the prey. Because of his mother, our calf is the survivor and not the cautionary example for others to learn from. Less than 20 kilometers remain until the reef and the safety of their Brillo herd, about 14 miles Americans. The mimic mother races ahead, leaving the weaker whales to their fate. The stone mother lags behind. Her movements are Confused, she's still in a state of shock over the death of her child. Our calf struggles to follow. It's much harder to swim outside of a larger whale's slipstream. And his mother is falling far behind again. He races back to be by her side. The calf has been running ahead of her sight and then returning back and forth seemed to coax his mother a little further each time. But now, the strength has failed. She can't even lift her fins in response. Her old wounds were opened by the physical exertion to save her child's life. She will not recover. He whistles the familiar call to play. Are you going to make me cry, South Scrimshaw? There is no more response. She has finally slipped from consciousness. Hashtag just nature things. Yep. She cannot remain with her calf any longer. He continues to press for a reaction. I just zone out for a second there, I think I did, god damn it. Desperation compounds the grief. Is that fan even still on? Yeah, I think it is. I just need to fix it. Anyway. I can't read that from here. Never mind. At this age, calves are completely dependent on a mother's milk and protection. With nowhere to go, the calf remains at his mother's side. The research team witness her final pulses of electrical activity fade. Next inch. R.I.P. Whale Mum. Pull one out. There is a long pause. Two researchers start a heated discussion on the ethics of intervention. But before any consensus is reached, the argument is interrupted by a low rumble over the hydrophone. The stone mother never left the area. She watches that calf from a distance. Good song. This time I'm not just making a bad joke, it's actually a good song. A new day begins to dawn over the coral reef. Brillo whales start to slurp, stir from slumber. They don't start to slur people from slumber. And if you're shouting racial slurs in your sleep, then you need help. Together, the stone mother and our calf have arrived safely. Through physically and emo 
sorry, though physically and emotionally depleted, neither has found any sleep. The calf gorges on milk, famished from the previous day's ordeal. This adoption in the wild may be extraordinary to witness happen. But acts of apparent generosity have not been an uncommon sight to see to anyone following this intensely social species. Start to slur from slumber as in like drunk people. Yeah, just wake up. Ah, that's him, I said. <laughs> Don't you come near me, I'm as well. I got my bum decorated to look like a pretzel. It's awesome. Anyway. Yeah. The stone mother's exterior appears to now be fully deflated. We can see a more familiar shape underneath. The outline of a young female whale. Oh. Huh. Sorry about that. Quite small in size for an adult specimen. She has saved our calf from certain death. Perhaps our calf is helping her continue on too. The young whale family finally slumbers. It is good that he takes the moment to recover while he can. He will need the rest. Ominous. In the morning, he will awaken to an overwhelming new world. You know what? It is a little early for my second break. But this seems like a good place. We will come back with chapter four, which is the last chapter currently available uh, after the break. As ever, have a drink, have a snack, take your meds if you still need to. Uh, you know, get up, move around, have a conversation with somebody who isn't me. And let the ads run if you can. I'll be back in a few minutes. Love you all. See you in a few. And I'm back. Hello, everyone. What is it about... Coming back from the thing that crashes the game. Why? That's weird. Anyway, hi, we're back. Uh, thanks for clipping me being deeply strange. I really hope it autosaved recently. Autosave? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, uh, slightly ominous thing. Overwhelming new world. Cool. Bright side, it was a free game. Yeah, no, I just think it's a really weird interaction. Between me pressing a button that acts through the Stream Deck app to change an OBS scene somehow, like, repeatedly crashes this game. Weird. I'm just going to make a manual save here as well. Oh, there's a quick save function as well. Cool. Don't know how to use it. Probably won't look. The miracle of Brillos is not that other creatures can live inside the whales. This sort of arrangement is not uncommon. You, the viewing audience, have countless residents inside your own body. Let's think about that! An adult human is composed of approximately 30 trillion cells. An estimated additional 39 trillion microbial cells, bacteria, viruses, and fungi live on and in the average person's body. Medical science has long understood the importance of the microorganisms within us and the role they play in good health. Interplanetary travel has elevated this research to the forefront of medicine. Alien atmospheres are a soup of microorganisms that Earth-raised animals have never encountered before. To the globe hopping human, the radical change of biome is first felt in the gut. Known as planetary dysbiosis, arrival sequence, sequence, that's a different word, arrival sickness, or simply the drags, all off world born humans experience an immobilizing nausea soon after entering the new atmosphere. 
Even with the year-long acclimation program one undergoes in low orbit, the drags cannot be eliminated. Aww. Arrival procedure for all travellers includes a period of convalescence at Mercy Star Hospital. Dysbiosis symptoms last anywhere from 14 days to 6 weeks. The worst documented cases persisted for over a year and required intensive care. Yikes. The Drags is a great colloquial name, absolutely also a good name for a punk band. Picture to limnologist and ranger first class, Mario Kichiro. Her 25 day recovery is documented as routine. And she had a cute cuddly lion. In a message to Kronos Earth Branch Cadets, RFC Okichiro warns, The initial headaches are too intense to get up and go to the bathroom. In the beginning, you'll mostly suffer on a bedpan. When food isn't coming up or out, you're forcing down a prescribed diet heavy in probiotics. I do mean forcing. The doctors require you to eat certain amounts every day, no matter how nauseated it makes you. Don't think that the kind nurses will let you skip meals, either. Your spoon or their chew, only thing you get to decide. Cuisine here is dominated by fermented and preserved foods. We blame the past shortage, past shortage of home refrigeration, state of the grid, whatever. Point is, when you inevitably smell yogurt or sauerkraut later, you'll feel violently ill and want to die. Every off world goes through that. You'll get over it. See you soon, rookies. Yes, I also like this take on the Space Bends. The miracle of Brillo Whales is their ability to pick and choose their occupants. Our whale will now begin this process of selection. Providing a backdrop for the next chapter is another amazing marine animal, whose colourful anatomy can construct whole ecosystems. Our Earth audience will find it a familiar species. Anybody watching this Twitch stream who isn't on Earth might have more trouble. It is the reef building coral. Yes, we still have that on Earth last time I checked, but you know. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. A bikili fish gently picks her way along a mountainous path of calcium carbonate exoskeletons. It's her daily prowl for food, and something tasty has her attention. A cat? Plump, bite-sized greebles are entrenched in the nooks below. That's a word that already exists! You can't just take a word. I mean, they can and have. Uh, a greeble is the weird detailing on the outside of like spaceships and that and sci-fi things that serves no feasible design purpose but makes things look sci-fi. Fun fact, I believe it was a term developed in the making of Star Wars. And some people pronounce it Greeblies and they're wrong. It'll take her quite a bit of work to pry them out. As the Bikili calculates the best approach of attack. Her preparations are interrupted. She joins the other fish, fleeing for their lives. A higher cast of the food chain steals the scene. This broom thing. It's a spotted barnacle claw. Okay, sure, all that. That's a body shape I dislike. Oh, the Gribbles. Look at them. They're like tardigrade frogs. One powerful yank extracts the entire colony hiding below like a barrel of monkeys. The host Brillo whale groans with dissatisfaction. This isn't a meal fit for a leviathan. They will continue browsing for something more substantial. I need to stop accidentally right clicking. Our whale watches the drama unfold from a safe distance, somewhat perplexed. 
the six years since we last rejoined him. Oh, time skip. The Great Reef has not run short of new surprises. From near and far, one can hear the calls of unknown brillos bounding off these cavernous walls. At least he still has someone familiar to rely on. Yeah. His adoptive mother is usually out of sight, but never too far away. She has changed quite a great deal since we last saw her. But she's alive, presumably. Perhaps in response to the Penumbra shark attack, she's undergone a zealous application of eye spots to her figure. While not as outwardly apparent, our young whale's body has undergone an even more radical change. Eye spots, they're a real kind of, um... What is it? Apisomatism. Uh, yeah. In earth animals as well. Fun fact, I get ap aposematism, not somatism. Meaning, not showing. Yeah, it's a brain. Uh, well, have a good meeting. Uh, the whales will probably still be here when you get back. We shall see. Scanning the whale. His skin layer is an immune system are fully developed and are ready to host other species. This dermatological puberty is the crossroad. He must decide what sort of Brillo he will become. And we must all decide what sort of Brillo we will become. How does a young whale make such a crucial decision? The choices are overwhelming, combinations are infinite, and mistakes are fatal. I mean, that's just a mood. One way to ensure future success is to replicate past success. Brillo youths find a welcoming adult and attempt to fashion themselves in their likeness. The older whale assists with offerings of seeds, eggs, larvae, and other materials needed to begin the garden. The younger whale remains close for the years after, learning new behaviour from the adult. Not every option available to a young whale is desirable. God, this art. This old timer is welcoming, but our whale is visibly uncomfortable. It isn't hard to imagine why, but on the other hand, another young bro no, don't do that. Another young Brillo might happily accept this body plan. Twitchy fingers. What shapes such individual preference? Realistically, there are far too many influences to chart, but from our limited data, there is one fact that stands out. We estimate that half of Brillos choose to replicate their own mothers. Our whale displays this preference towards his biological mother. These ribbon plants are the same variety she once wore. Our calf returns here every day. But it is no use. This Brillo whale is deceased. Nothing but a clean skeleton remains beneath the foliage. Let's dwell on that image. Almost nothing. Our optics technician noted a strange blip while alternating camera modes. Zooming in. And switching to infrared. Shows an ordinary thermal image. As expected, the plants are close to the ambient ocean temperature. But after several seconds, the intermittent blinking resumes. This is an older model IR strobe, typically worn attached to the helmet or vest for identification in emergency situations. Upon retrieving the device and referencing the serial number, we can confirm this deceased whale was the first Brillo ever encountered by humans. We've met some history. This no! The story dates back to the early days of Outpost Zeta's construction. A fishing boat captain ignored an ominous weather forecast and went to sea collecting crab traps. 
Conditions deteriorated faster than his optimistic assumptions. The boat was smashed by a wave while returning to harbour. In the aftermath, two deckhands were found missing. Lodestar 1, a heavy aerial command ship. Blah, 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 blah. Lodestar 1, a heavy aerial command ship able to withstand the violent winds, took off from Vajrapani Airport to begin the search. Scanning the roiling wave below, aided by GPS tracker and IR beacons, the two shipmates were located. They were together and clinging for their lives to some unidentified debris. The airplane circled in the turbulent sky above, tracking the men until a rescue helicopter could arrive. After further storm-related delays, RRH-307 Kingfisher launched, flying low to keep beneath the still formidable clouds. The following are archive recordings from that day. Low Star Tech Sergeant Samantha Anders. 307 Kingfisher. Oh, right, that's one of the people needing to be rescued. Kingfisher Pilot, Lieutenant Commander Felix McGulloch. Go. Oh, no, wait, Lodestar's the plane, Kingfisher's the. Helicopter. Yes, I'm paying attention. 307 Kingfisher, we've updated your arrival coordinates. Confirm you've received. Solid copy, Lodestar. Received. Briefing said our guys were hiding in a cave. Is there a PIW? Negative. Survivors are inside some kind of raft. The raft is now moving. Roger. Okay, got eyes on it now. Second officer, Marshal Clark. Visual on survivor, Captain. Altitude. Altitude. I see him. Gonna bring it as close as I can. Our guy won't be swimming far with these waves. Altitude. Altitude. Copy that. Almost directly over him. Forward 15 feet. Hold. Holding. Rescue divers checklist complete. Send them down. He's in. Video link is live. Heads up, Kingfisher. A couple big waves are headed your way. About 20 seconds. Copy. I think he'll make it to the raft before the swell hits. 10 seconds. Almost seems like the raft is moving towards him. What the? <laughs> Kingfisher? What's your status? Kingfisher, report. Respond. Everyone's all alive for now. If it was going to eat him, it would have done it already, right? Um... Let's get them in the chopper before we find out. There's another... There's another one! Great. Lodestar, any thoughts? Felix, I don't think there's any protocol for this in the handbook. Cap, hold steady for a moment. I think they're... They're coming to us. Hey, can we keep him, Dad? If you want a sea monster, then you'll have to feed and walk it yourself. Shucks, you think I'm not old enough to care for a pet? Diver's headed back down. Second rescue in progress. 307 Kingfisher, Lodestar is peeling off. Good work done there. Much obliged, Lodestar. We'll include you in the highlight reel. Thanks. Hey, and CC that footage to the bio nerds too. I bet they flip. The bio nerds, here referring to scientists of Station Zeta Laboratories, soon re received copies of this material. They did indeed flip. I love the tangents. 
Anyway, yes, first Brillo Whale, now dead. Sorry. While it is interesting that the garden can partially survive on, none of it can be transferred without the living adult to help. But it reminds him of home. Our whale must find comfort in the familiar scent and touch. However, time spent on what he cannot have is time wasted. There's a... I like that sentence. Waiting too long to start a garden could bring other health complications. He will have to move on. Our whale goes on a search for another plant-based brillo. For reasons unknown, such brillos are conspicuously absent this season. It seems as if anything resembling his mother has migrated elsewhere, or it just turned out to be a bad strategy. One single exception is discovered. And he is a spectacular example of aquatic foliage. The shaggy coat is as full and as beautiful as the late mother's. But not all brillos are welcoming. I mean, you say the late mother, that sounds like she's dead rather than just this look is dead. Day after day he tries to draw the adult into play, and day after day receives the cold shoulder. The adult flatly refuses to acknowledge his existence. This male has tunnel vision on the single purpose of mating. Babysitting is not in the agenda. We watch an attempt to woo a female fail pitifully. She is clearly put off by his little sidekick. Tugging roughly on his leaves. Days of pent up agitation are suddenly unloaded. Our whale is, ch our whale is chased off at the point of a skewer. It may feel like a painful sacrifice, but a plant body is not an option. There's a dizzying amount of other choices remaining, and one of them will have to do. Another morning dawns. No, the nocturnal animals have returned to slumber, and the frantic energy of diurnal animals resumes. And funky music. For our researchers, every day following the whale is a journey into an uncharted wilderness. Only a small fraction of the species here have been recorded. There is so much inexplicable behaviour to document. Like this art. This, is, this, this looks like what you get if you google the word inexplicable. You could write a dissertation on this one shot. Recent discoveries have centred on the varieties of coral present. The reef itself is now understood to be a multi-layered structure. Tangent! Fringing reef. The Great Southern Reef is a fringing reef. The inhabitants can be categorized into three zones based on depth. The unique character of the Southern Reef is owed to the Spire Coral, which lives across all three of these zones. Spire coral can survive at the lowest depths where it faces little competition. It gets very large indeed. Once fixed to solid ground, spire corals stack atop one another, upwards toward the sunlight that will fuel more productive respiration. Shallow water corals soon find these raised platforms and perch themselves upon it. This is not a cooperative relationship. The spire coral is eventually smothered and dies. Under accumulated weight, the structural integrity is lost. And the spire shatters. Collapsed back down to lower depths. Living spire coral can again re-emerge and the cycle repeats unendingly. God, the writer on this has put a lot of thought into it. I love this. This constant tossing and turning creates a porous and dynamic landscape, 
veined with small tunnels and dotted with caves. Thousands of small animals make this subterranean environment their niche. For example, saltwater tadpoles spend their early life stages in underground. Still, they can emerge above as a fearsome predator. Relative to their size, that is. God, that is such a David Attenborough Planet Earth cut. <laughs> but anyway, back to the actual thing. Progress and knowledge march forward through Tala's work, but we often share in our young whale's bewilderment. Who is this? What is on his head? What's going on? Now that's a screenshot! <laughs> we do not know. We just don't know. <laughs> ah, there's a reference I make a lot. Our whale runs away and we simply follow. One afternoon, it seems our young whale's persistent searching has been rewarded. A loud song heralds him from the distance. Past these bacon fish. A Brillo hunting party returns. Their high spirits means that all had a good kill. The group's leader is calling to our whale. Our youth remains in place, which allows the adult to approach. These whales are sophisticated pack hunters. The Chowper, a stupid but friendly shark, fully totally accepts the Brillos as their own. Compared to the painful transmogrification other Brillos endure, this silky costume is minimally invasive and provides maximum returns. And it's a plant. Really? This success with symbiosis strategy is limited only by the pack's willingness to share it with others. An open invitation from the leader is a golden opportunity. Something isn't right. A whale is fixated on the chowper. Yeah, I didn't need that, thank you. Nature red in tooth and jump scare. It is a tragedy that our whale seems unable to tolerate sharks of any kind. Tron will do that to you. He flees. Over the weeks, we observe our subject whale becoming increasingly distressed. To critically suppress unpleasant feelings and adopt a symbiosis plan, a brillo whale cannot survive unplanted. He can perceive himself failing to integrate, of course, but the building internal agitation is not a force that will help him adapt better. Autumn draws to a close. Several new varieties of Brillo begin to arrive from cold latitudes. These are mostly hunter archetypes who can live a life less dependent on the reef's concentrated bounty. Camouflage whale waits for prey to swim near. Let's read about camouflage. Our baby whale has anxiety. Yeah. Relatable though. Active camouflage or adapted camouflage refers to skin coloration that can rapidly shift to match a changing environment. These octopus have linked their tentacle nerve endings together, allowing them to network visual information between all bodies. Color change is omnidirectional, instant and accurate. The swiftness and precision of these changes exceeds any Earth octopus ability. They are not the only example of animals here possessing very advanced skin chromatophores. Researchers hope to understand why they have evolved in more sophisticated fashion than their Earth counterparts, which we'll read about now. Oh, this has a different red card. 
While this documentary is restricted to its limited mandate, we believe in good faith that the following question is unavoidable and must now be answered. Why would a species on another planet have an Earth counterpart? Because, I mean, a similar ecosystem would evolve many similar solutions. Convergent evolution was the obvious first hypothesis. I mean, yeah, I just said it. This is the phenomenon where different species can evolve similar features when faced with the same evolutionary pressure. For example, we can find similarities in the wings of unrelated flying vertebrates. Similar problems craft similar solutions. While this obviously still holds true, it is not the answer to our question. This lizard looks like an Earth chameleon. This whale looks like an Earth whale. Because they share a recent common ancestor with Earth animals. The true answer is directed panspermia. Tangent! How many layers of tangent are we on? It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. So Aristotle advised us. Aristotle said a lot of things. In that high-minded spirit, we can look back at Francis Crick as one of biology's fearless thinkers and thieves. He's best known for his work with James Watson uncovering the structure of DNA more than a century ago. This earned them and Morris Wilkins the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1962. And he stole it! This is Rosalind Franklin Erasure, come on game. <laughs> He was also uncomfortably acknowledged by 20th century colleagues as a proponent of directed panspermia, that a deliberate extraterrestrial origin to life on Earth should be taken into serious consideration. While Crick's hypothesis fails to match our current best understanding, his unorthodox thinking landed him closer to the truth than any of his contemporaries could have believed. Oh, we're going so far down this rabbit hole now. What about his unorthodox thinking? Well, I guess we were certainly lucky, and of course you give the impression in your book that we didn't really do too much thinking, but uh, we were lucky, I think, for two reasons. We, <coughs> we were thinking about the problem at the right time, and then the two of us, by collaborating, when one of us got on the wrong track, the other one could get us out of it. But if, if um, I thought there were three, three chains at one stage, you were sure there were two, if uh, you thought that the... Um, phosphates had to be in the middle and I would be the devil's advocate and say put them on the outside and I think this is very important in solving structures of this kind because the difficulty is that you've got to give several logical steps one after the other if you get go wrong you get one person gets too fond of their own ideas I think another thing that which helped us in our collaboration was we weren't at least afraid of being very candid to each other to the point of being rude and if you don't have constant interchange and chatting together and saying what you think of the other people's ideas to their face, I don't think you can solve problems of this kind. That's mostly fair, but also his technique was to steal from your assistants. Right, we're climbing out of the rabbit hole. Life on Earth originated on Earth. Abiogenesis took place in deep sea hydrothermal vents approximately 3.7 billion years ago. Recent history has revealed that three other planets also sustain life. Aria, Gauz, and Earth 2. Aria, Gauz, and Earth 2 are affectionately referred to as sister planets of Earth due to their similarities. It may be more accurate to call them Earth's children. They were barren until intentionally planted from Earth's highly evolved genetic stock. Isolated across light years of space, the forces of evolution then brought divergent results. Along a different but always familiar timeline, all three bloomed into wonderful new cradles of complex life. 
This brief summary does not do justice to the incomprehensibly computed and ongoing work of planetary curation. But suffice to say, even the professionals struggle to grasp a simplified understanding. Okay, but seeded by who? What are we talking about? Crowd force, yes. Oh god, we're still not out of the tangent hole, are we? Okay. Are we out of the tangent hole? I think we are. Camouflage whale. This kind of strategy requires a good deal of patience. A whale, sensing the hunter, swims wide. The camo whale politely hails him. Other Brillo whales aren't the target of his trap. Our whale replies with mistrust and leaves. Yep, this is me meeting strangers as well. Especially if they're wearing a row of octopuses on their head. Something is wrong. Our whale's once irrepressible curiosity has grown increasingly muted. Even wonders like bioluminescence provoke no reaction. These lamplighter fish are practicing their jousting in preparation for the annual mating competition. The event is soon. It's only a one-night affair, and they will all die immediately afterwards. We think it would be quite the enriching spectacle. But the fish seem to be of no interest. Our research objectives all involve how a planted brillo changes gene expression throughout its life. An unplanted whale is no use to us. Interesting how we're getting what feel like kind of directorial commentary at points as well. There is a fear that our biometric implants have been invested on a losing whale. Biometric implants, you say? When a gene pool is too small, there's no way for a population to discard deleterious mutations. Without sexual recombination, offspring will have at least as much mutation as their parents. Your errors simply accumulate. Muller's Ratchet describes a process of ir irreversible decline where each generation is one notch less fit than before. Can all of the higher intelligence or wisdom of the universe provide salvation if one's very genetic code is winding down to destruction? The Kronos Project is a late hour rewrite of a complex genome. It's an attempt to engineer a viable escape from an extinction vortex. Extinction Vortex, who I saw at Stop It Emma. The humans, still a robust and healthy animal, are conscripted to provide a variety of labour, which our forebears have grown too enfeebled and small in number to handle themselves. Of course, we do not do this work, work without our own motivations. The fruits of this labour could change how we understand illness and ageing. However, the final objective to fundamentally decouple our genetic fate from natural machinations and assert the reins of technology is still widely contested. In contrast to other human enclaves, the constitution of Aria proudly allows this debate to take place in open forums, which is why we base our science there. We probably have tax breaks too. But before we can discuss contingency plans, our Brillo finally begins to break bad habits. Yeah, go. This unknown youth has snagged a lamplighter, and presents it now to our whale. Perhaps he was infused to share his catch, and our whale happened to be closest. Brillo interactions can be opaque, but these two have clearly hit it off. For once, our whale does not withdraw. He is proactively engaging instead of passively responding. Accidental right click at the same time as CPU chug hit, that was weird. It's a much welcome scene, but it begs the question, what changed? What external factors could have contributed to a more outgoing posture? Did our cameras miss a life-changing event? Does this stranger seem less threatening than all the others? Yes, hydrating stretch reminders while I'm having CPU chug, good idea. Oh. Naturally they hit as soon as the chug ends, as is the way. 
Chagan sounds like a esoteric insult. And or a village in Sussex. It is true that our whale, having been born outside the herd, has consistently lacked peer contact his own age. Young brillos cannot transmit garden organisms between each other, so the interaction here probably feels less fraught than it might with an adult who could permanently dose him with life-altering symbioses. We hypothesize that juvenile brillo association is a necessary prior step to adult interaction. I mean, isn't that just true in developmental psychology in general? Regardless of how correct this assertion is, it successfully buys our study additional time. <laughs> Again, saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> we came up with a new hypothesis in order to stall and continue to get funding. The two whales spend the rest of the day playing and are still chasing fish together when we leave them. Night falls. But our whale is not asleep. GPS coordinates show he's swimming somewhere. As his aberrant behaviour is still under scrutiny, the team moves to investigate. A spotlight is aimed overboard. We discover more than just our whale. He's travelling with a pod of other youths. They all sing with curiosity at the sudden light shining from above. Sudden lights, uh, the... 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 The Latvian alt rock band. I didn't just make that up. Uh, are they Latvian or were they Estonia? I think they were Latvian. Really, really not important. We cut the power to avoid further disturbance. It's soon clear where the Brillos are headed. Also, could you not just use like an IR camera? first glimmers of action appear in the near distance. The night of the lamplight fish has begun. The ocean starts to flash brilliantly as males battle for the attention of females. The weak are pierced open, spilling bioluminescence into the water. They shine with complete indifference to predators attacking. Known as predator satiation, there are simply too many to all be eaten. And it's all very green. His belly full of glowing fish bits, our whale watches the show reach its climax. It seems like he'll be up all night with the others. Confident in his safety, we recall our camera drones to finish their scheduled recharge. By blocking wave activity, the barrier reef creates a wide lagoon behind it. The placid water stretches for several kilometres before being overtaken by a mangrove forest. Parts are so shallow that they become too exposed to air at low tide. At high tide, other areas are deep enough for a troublesome young whale to get lost in. And they have this leggy shrimp. No more leggy shrimp. His friends weren't adventurous enough to follow him today. And for good reason, as our whale realises once the water level starts to drop again. There's no time to play with the locals. The outgoing seawater feeds to several deep channels. Whisked through the trenches, our whale rides the rip current to safety. No control over where it's taking him. So to safety is doing a lot of work. After a lengthy ride, spat out far from where he began. This is the end of the Great Reef. 
it's exposed to dangerous territory, but our whale can't help himself from having a look around. There's a sudden realisation that he's being watched. Hi! Something is stirring within the cave behind him. Pyramid head? Oh, it's another Brillo whale. Our whale approaches, but there is no friendly greeting. This isolated loner is an exile from the herd. Banishment is reserved for excessive violence against fellow Brillos. Most likely it was a mating joust that escalated to fatal combat. A deteriorated mental state from years of isolation is what has made him truly dangerous. Our Brillo can understand that a noiseless approach signals an attack. He whistles another greeting. It's met with an oppressive silence. The crown of a shark's draw jaw attests to this whale was staggering strength. But his secret weapon lies inside the crow's nest atop his, hard, atop his hardened armor. Wait, sorry, just... Yeah, sorry. Couldn't follow the thread there for a second. The Vorpix octopus wakes when it senses a kill is imminent. He serves the role of a hunting partner who swims in advance. Usually it latches over the eyes of prey and attacks with its serrated beak. That's... That's an image. Yeah. But when prey is so pitifully weak, he prefers to spectate. Our whale is far from being scared. He's experiencing a whole other emotion. I thought that said a whale other emotion. He knows. This was unexpected. Abandoned in caution, the calf sings and plays like he's found a new friend. He goes in for a nuzzle and the harsh exterior cracks. I mean you would. How long has it been since the old timer experienced any warmth of companionship? Maybe having a little apprentice killer won't be so bad. Grunts, struggling to remember a song that isn't also a threat. This isn't the scene of bloodshed the octopus wanted. Octopus is just stood there like, what are they doing? Why? Okay. If I'm out. It seems he's witnessed this cycle once before, as he knows what must be done. Let's dig into that. This animal is neg negligibly negligibly senescent, meaning it expresses no evidence of biological aging. It's one of the only long-lived cephalopods that has not been culled. Why? Our researchers suspect this octopus to be at least four centuries old, and cephalopods who survive so long possess a devious intelligence. Huh. Yeah, struggling to remember a song that wasn't a threat. That, that's a banger line. The Vorpix presents our whale with a living piece of the armor plating. quick feel for the soft spot. And then like you getting bubble tea. And the deed is done. When the young whale wakes up, the implant will already have sprouted roots to hold it firmly fixed in the skin. With this major milestone now documented, the mobile lab departs and will not rejoin the whale again until his adulthood. 
Implants will continue to transmit information about his physical development for a 20-year remote observation period. This also ends the documentary team's access to the whale, and concludes the first phase of our project. For us, raw data is far less compelling than the first-hand observation of his body being reconstructed. 20 years is a long time for impatient humans to wait. When we do meet our whale again, it's hard to guess now what we might find. All the changes he experiences over two decades will be witnessed in a single moment. AKA our funding ran out and we're annoyed that we can't watch. Absolutely, I don't, I don't think they're even saying the quiet part particularly quiet here. It should be nothing short of a complete metamorphosis. This concludes South Scream Shore Part 1. Please keep designated channels open for the transmission of Part 2. Which we will when it exists. That game's rad. Written and illustrated by Nathan O'Marsh. Just stellar work for a one person project. Like, apparently people were complaining about the fact, because this, this was released on itch episodically, uh, the Steam releases the first four chapters, uh, and people were annoyed that it was taking him about a year a chapter. But, like, look at that art. It's so good. Check that Twitter out. Uh, what's that Twitter? Ah, free sound credits. So many free sound credits. So many free sound credits, Jesus. Special thanks to the NOAA and National Park Service for public domain recordings. Okay, so presumably this is America. Voice narration and speech synthesized using tools by Eleven Labs. Hmm. Hmm. That I'm less thrilled by. Just, just as a voice actor, I do have strong feelings about the use of AI uh, to do the voice acting on your games. Because the speech synth is it's not not as good, and it's not a person doing it. And anyway, let's let's not get sidetracked onto that. But hey, there's a reason I turned the voice off and. Uh, just did it myself. I mean, as well as just because I like to do that. That was most of it. But yeah, that was rad. I like that a lot. Okay. And, most importantly, as I said, this was a... As much as a stream, this was a stability test for our new connection. Which I am glad to report has been rock solid throughout. So hopefully that particular tech gremlin has been chased away. There will be more. There are always more. But hopefully we should stop just dropping the stream so much. Which is great, because that was annoying me so much. Uh, yeah, this is where I do the wrap-up. Sea buns always return. Yeah, I know. I know. But this one's chased off for now, and I'll take that. Uh, so yes, wrap-up. If, uh... God, it's been two weeks and I forget the wrap-up. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks for staying to the end. It means a lot. If you've been watching this, you know where to find me. But, God, there's a throwback. Uh, uh, but just in case, this is twitch.tv slash sarasent. That's S-E-R-A-S-E-N-T, the House of Hubris. Streaming every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at 2 p.m. British time. That is 9 a.m. Eastern, Pacific. Other time zones are available. But you'll have to do the maths yourself. And hey, if you don't want to do the maths yourself, why not just throw us a follow? And then you'll get a notification whenever I'm around. 
If you do miss anything, VODs are on the Twitch for eight weeks after the fact. For everything else, uh, there is the YouTube link is, I believe, down there. It says VOD Archive. I actually checked. Been saying I would, and nobody believed me. It only took me several months. Uh, but yeah, or that is youtube.com slash at House of Hubris. Where you can find recordings going all the way back to the start of the channel, which is closing in on three years, which terrifies me, frankly. <laughs> We're over the two and a half year mark, and I'm just like, what is going on? Uh, yeah. But yeah, we've played lots of games, uh, so there should be something that's your speed, and if there isn't, let us know what would be, and I'll see what I can do. What else? If you want to support uh, my ambitions to voice a nature documentary monetarily, you can, of course, cheer or subscribe on Twitch, but you very much don't have to. Just turn up and hang out and be chill and be good to each other, and then everyone's having a good time. Archylo was pray at Centrum. Oh, it's Archylo. It's like from the sky all the way to the center. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Where was I? Yes. Supporting. Like I say, great. You don't have to do it. Uh, this is my periodic reminder that if you have Amazon Prime, you do get a free Twitch sub. Uh, and, you know, you should use it. Not, it'd be great if you used it here, but frankly, you should use it somewhere, because otherwise that's just money that's staying in Amazon's pockets rather than going to a streamer. So, you know, support them. Or me, if you like. But hey. Uh, if you want to find me elsewhere on the internet, uh, links are down there, I think. Unless they've changed the layout, which it looks like they kind of might. Uh, but on Twitter is currently still the best place to find me. Which, you know, because inertia. Uh, where I, I, uh, bleh, bleh. Wow, yeah. If you can't use the links, that is Twitter at House of Hubris. Or, excitingly, as of literal minutes before this stream started, I am now on Mastodon, finally. I've been meaning to move over forever. Uh... So, for now, I will be keeping both active in as much as I remember to. Uh, but that is at House of Hubris at kind.social. So, uh, that's H O U S E O F H U B R I S at K I N D dot. Yeah. That, I, sorry, I was just remembering the address. I do know how to spell social. Uh, S-O-C-I-A-L. Cool. I think that's everything. So, now that we know the system is, touch wood, working, we will be back to our regular schedule uh, from tomorrow. And we will be playing something. We're always playing something here, but we shall see what it'll be. I have some ideas, but you will have to wait. Uh, I think I'm done blathering at this point. So, love you all. And yeah, once again, thanks everyone for being here. See you on Thursday for something else. Bye-bye.